The scriptures were written to bless and encourage us, and surely they do that. We do thank heaven for every chapter and verse we've ever been given. But have you noticed that every now and then a passage will appear that reminds us we're falling a little short? For example, the Sermon on the Mount begins with soothing, beautiful, gentle Beatitudes. But then in the verses that follow, we are told, among other things, not only not to kill, but also not even to be angry. We're told not only not to commit adultery, but also not to even have impure thoughts. To those who ask for it, we're to give our coat and then give our cloak also. We're to love our enemies, bless those who curse us, and do good to them that hate us. If that's your morning scripture study, and after reading just that far, you're pretty certain you're not going to get good marks on your gospel report card, then the final commandment in the chain is sure to finish the job. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. With that concluding imperative, we want to go back to bed and pull the covers over our head. Such celestial goals seem beyond our reach. Yet surely the Lord would never give us a commandment he knew we could not keep. Let's see where this quandary takes us. Around the church, I hear many struggle with this issue. I'm just not good enough. I fall so far short. I'll never measure up. I hear this from teenagers. I hear it from missionaries. I hear it from new converts. I hear it from lifelong members. One insightful Latter-day Saint, Sister Darla Isaacson, has observed that Satan has somehow managed to make covenants and commandments seem like curses and condemnations. For some, he has turned the ideals and inspiration of the gospel into self-loathing and misery-making. What I now say in no way denies or diminishes any commandment of God he has ever given us. I believe in his perfection and I know we are his spiritual sons and daughters with divine potential to become as he is. I also know that as children of God, we should not demean or vilify ourselves as if beating up on ourselves is somehow going to make us the person God wants us to become. No, with a willingness to repent, and a desire for increased righteousness always in our hearts, I would hope we could pursue personal improvement in a way that doesn't include getting ulcers or anorexia, feeling depressed, or demolishing self-esteem. That is not what the Lord wants for primary children or anyone else who honestly sings, I'm trying to be like Jesus. So I believe that Jesus did not intend his sermon on this subject to be a verbal hammer for battering us into our shortcomings. No, I believe he intended it to be a tribute to who and what God the Eternal Father is and what we can achieve with him in eternity. In any case, I am grateful to know that in spite of my perfections, at least God is perfect. That at least He is, for example, able to love His enemies. Because too often, due to the natural man and woman in us, you and I are sometimes that enemy. 
how grateful I am that at least God can bless those who despitefully use him because without wanting to or attending to we all despitefully use him sometimes I'm grateful that God is merciful and a peacemaker because I need mercy and the world needs peace of course all we say of the father's virtues we also say of his only begotten son who lived and died under the same perfection yea come unto Christ and be perfected in him Moroni pleads love God with all your might mind and strength then by his grace you may be perfect in Christ our only hope for true perfection is in receiving it as a gift from heaven we won't earn it thus the grace of Christ offers us not only salvation from sorrow and sin and death but also salvation from our own persistent self-criticism let me use one of the savior's parables to say this in a little different way a servant was in debt to his king for the amount of 10,000 talents hearing the servant's plea for patience and mercy the lord of that servant was moved with compassion and forgave the debt but then that same servant would not forgive a fellow servant who owed him 100 pence on hearing this the king lamented to the one he had forgiven should not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant even as i had pity on thee now there's some little difference of opinion among scholars regarding the monetary values mentioned here and forgive the u.s monetary reference but to make the math easy if the smaller unforgiven 100 pence debt were say a hundred dollars in current times then the 10,000 talent debt so freely forgiven would have approached one billion dollars or more as a personal debt that is an astronomical number totally beyond our comp comprehension nobody can shop that much for the purposes of this parable it is supposed to be incomprehensible it is supposed to be beyond our ability to grasp to say nothing of beyond our ability to repay that is because this isn't a story about two servants arguing in the New Testament it's a story about us the fallen human family mortal debtors transgressors and prisoners all every one of us is a debtor and the verdict was imprisonment for every one of us and there we would have all remained were it not for the grace of a king who sets us free because he loves us and is moved with compassion toward us Jesus uses an unfathomable measurement here because his atonement is as an unfathomable gift given at an incomprehensible cost that it seems to me is at least part of the meaning behind Jesus's charge to be perfect we may not be able to demonstrate yet the 10,000 talent perfection the father and the son have achieved but it is not too much for them to ask us that we be a little more godlike in little things that we speak and act and love and forgive and repent and improve at least at a hundred pence level 
of perfection, which it is clearly within our ability to do. My brothers and sisters, except for Jesus, there have been no flawless performances on this earthly journey we're pursuing. So while in mortality, let's strive for steady improvement without obsessing over what behavioral scientists might call toxic perfectionism. We should avoid that latter excessive expectation of ourselves and of others. And I might add of those who are called to serve in the church, which for Latter-day Saints means everyone for we're all called to serve somewhere. Brothers and sisters, every one of us aspires to a more Christ-like life than we often succeed in living. If we admit that honestly and are trying to improve, we're not hypocrites, we're human. May we refuse to let our own mortal follies and the inevitable shortcomings of even the best men and women around us to make us cynical about the truths of the gospel, the truthfulness of the church, our hope for the future, or the possibility of godliness. If we persevere, then somewhere in eternity, our refinement will be finished and complete which is the New Testament meaning of perfection. I testify of that grand destiny made available to us by the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself continued from grace to grace until in his immortality he received a perfect fullness of celestial glory. I testify that in this and every hour he is with nail-scarred hands extending to us that same grace, holding on to us and encouraging us, refusing to let us go until we are safely home in the embrace of heavenly parents. For such a perfect moment, I continue to strive, however clumsily. For such a perfect gift, I continue to give thanks, however inadequately.